tonight. Um, I really want to get into some, some of the Bible verses of, uh, that are used to present the idea that the earth is flat. And I want Dr. Faulkner to just kind of tell us, and, and Dr. Faulkner, by the way, I did a Facebook Live uh, and already got some notes of what some people have said. Uh, Matt Wright, um, I don't know that these people joined the webinar tonight, but Matt Wright said, hey, listen, Jesus went into the clouds. We meet Jesus in the clouds. He's going to call us into the clouds. Clearly, that's what it's talking about. Isaiah uses both terms, sphere and globe. Therefore, when it uses it, and I, I read the passage, Isaiah 40, 22, right as I started that broadcast, it's him that sits on the circle of the earth. And so just, I recognize there's, there's a lot of people that make arguments for flat earth using the Bible. He said, Matt said, the globe equals the big bang and evolution. So if you believe globe, you're kind of falling for all of that. Uh, John said, I find issues with the globe theory. The earth is the center of the universe. And the Bible makes that very, very clear, John says. Uh, Zachary says, hey, listen, don't call it a conspiracy. You produce a model that matches all the flight logs. Show us why it takes so long to get to certain places. Scott um, said he wants to debate the topic with us. So I, I believe me, I really get it. There's, there's a lot of passion. And I, I got to be honest with you, if I believed in the flat earth, if I believed the earth was flat and we had been totally deceived by NASA and all the governments of the world were lying to us and uh, several of the commenters were talking about Freemasonry, how Freemasonry has really, you know, they're controlling what people think. I guess I'd, I'd almost be as passionate as some of these individuals that jump on, on, on the comments or, or do this. So I, I, don't, I don't just dismiss the passion. And I'm, you've been in this for a while, for the last several years, Dr. Faulkner. So what is your, uh, just give me your perspective real quick before we jump into the, the, the actual uh, the verses that we want to jump into. Give me your perspective on kind of how you view this topic. Well, I'm, I'm a lot like you, what you began with, talking about some people you knew that went through this splitting up families and such. For me, it was four and a half years ago, February of 2016. Uh, I had conversations with three different adults over a week's period of time, each one of them concerned about a young person they knew who was into flat earth. And I thought, what's going on? And looking back for a couple of years prior to that, I had had hints of this. Somebody would send me a an odd video about it. And I thought, well, that's interesting, but I didn't tie it together. When I, when I had three conversations in one week, I realized something was afoot. So I came home, I was traveling at the time, came home and I, and I started looking on the internet. I was surprised just how much was out there. And I was about a year into the movement, I guess. It had started blowing up about a year before, uh, promulgated by YouTube largely, but other social media. And um, I saw that it was very quickly an alarming uh, trend. It was having an effect upon people in a bad way. I had, uh, right away, I got a guy emailing me and arguing with things and his argument was over the top almost insulting I, I, I have a thick skin though um, then I started hearing from people uh, a wife that was concerned about her husband who his demeanor completely changed when he got into this um, another one where a husband was worried about his wife her, her demeanor had changed tremendously and then I heard from from parents whose kids were into this and it was causing ruckuses in households then I heard about churches and um, some churches on the verge of splitting, and certainly people had worn out their welcome by, by pushing this, this, this thing that nobody else in the church wanted to have. And people then going churchless. I think many flat earthers, since they can't find a church that, that espouses and teaches uh, uh, what they believe about the earth being flat, and there are some that churches that do, by the way, uh, they, uh, they just stopped going to church altogether and started doing their own thing. And that, I think, actually works against what we're told in the New Testament what to do. So it's having a detrimental effect. There's a, there's a secular branch of, of a non-Christian branch of the Flat Earth Movement. I've seen that when I've gone to the Flat Earth meetings. I've seen that uh, in display. But then you have a large contingent of people who claim to be Christians, born again. Uh, they want to take the Bible seriously, and I think many of them are genuine. Uh, but they're just wrong about these things. And so it's a, it's a threat, I think, to Christianity. I think it, it, it's a threat to my ministry. Because I think in some respects, uh, the people who helped launch this a few years ago are, are using it as a vehicle to, as, to make a parody of the creation science movement. There's no other way of putting it. It doesn't mean that everybody involved in it's doing it. I just think certain people who launched it uh, were, were attempting to do that. And they've unfortunately enlisted people into their movement that uh, formally agreed with us and still have respect for Answers in Genesis and other creation ministries. 
but um, are unwittingly working to undermine exactly what we do. So it's, it's, a, it's a threat to our ministry, threat to my personal ministry, and it's, uh, I say it's a threat personally to people and a threat to churches. I even have, one of the things Scott Morrison said on Facebook was uh, it, it, he almost equated to if a real Christian will not believe in a globe earth. And the way he related it on Facebook, I'm going, you're putting, you're putting Christianity on terms of if you're a real Christian, you won't believe in a globe earth. You're putting this whole flat earth versus globe earth thing on a pedestal right there next to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is what Christianity is all about. And I, and I just thought to myself, that's dangerous ground to go that far and to say that a globe earth equals, you know, or, or Christianity equals flat earth. And if you believe in globe earth, you got to check your Christianity. I thought, what, we are way far away from what is a, a basic understanding and doctrine of of salvation when you put those two on the same terms. Yeah, I've encountered that too. I think most uh, flat earth Christians I've encountered don't go that far, but there are some that do. Uh, so many of them speak of the uh, strong delusion that the Lord will send uh, to people so that they will believe a lie rather than the truth. And they, they try to argue that globe earth is part of that delusion. But if you look very carefully and understand that passage, <clears throat> that delusion, is the, the, the rejection of the truth people are being punished for by having that strong delusion sent is rejection of the gospel. And, and if you try to add anything to that, then you're adding to the gospel. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so when p- even people who don't intentionally try to say, well, it's a salvation issue are cur- kind of making that if they think that globe earth is part of that strong delusion in context, then they're saying that if you, if you believe the earth is a globe, then you're under the strong delusion, which means you can't believe the truth of, of salvation in the gospel, which is wrong, clearly wrong. Definitely. Well, let me jump into a couple passages here. I don't know if you have some that you, I mean, obviously you, you address these in your book. Uh, I want to jump into some of the passages that uh, just kind of lay out this idea. Maybe we'll start with this. Uh, the Bible says over and over and over, the earth is fixed. The earth is immovable. Uh, First Corinthians uh, pulled that one up. He fixed the earth. It's firm. It's immovable. Psalms many, many times talks about how he's fixed the immovable earth. It's, it's firm. It's, this is the foundation. He, he has made it not to be moved. He fixed it on a foundation that can never be shaken. Uh, he's the one who fashioned it. He fixed this himself. He's the one who did this. It will not be moved. So there's several passages that talk about that concept that the earth will not be moved. And so this, this model comes in. By the, by the way, for, for those watching, and, and we've got a bunch of you on here, for those of you guys watching, I'm seeing your names pop in. I just want you to know, we did a, a webinar before this one, specifically dealing with the science of, does the science fit a globe earth or does it fit a flat earth? So we did that. That's why today we're focusing not necessarily on the science, even though it will come up, but we want to focus on the scripture of, uh, of the flat earth movement and go, okay, does the Bible support one or the other? Is it neutral on the subject? I mean, what, what does the Bible say? So that's why we're jumping right into the scripture when we get to this concept of, okay, when the Bible says the earth will not be moved, and yet you're going to declare that it's spinning at 1,000 miles an hour at the equator, Dr. Faulkner, uh, doesn't, that, doesn't that disagree with what the Bible says? So I'll just release okay. that and say, come on, prove that wrong. There, there, there are two major points to make here. Uh, number one is that even if those passages indicate the earth is stationary in some sense, absolute stationary, does not move at all, um, that doesn't, it doesn't follow that the earth is flat. In fact, there has been a geocentric movement among Christians now for, for half a century. I first encountered it uh, 30, uh, 35 years ago, probably 30, at least 30 years ago. Um, and the, the movement has certain adherents. It was kind of growing in the late 80s, early 90s, and kind of, kind of plateaued a bit. And these people, to a man, believe the earth is a globe. I mean, there's been a geocentric movement for some time among Christians, and you probably know a few ge- uh, geocentrists, I'm sure, yep. as, I, as do I. And yet, they would strongly disagree with the flat earthers. So even, even if, you, if the Bible taught that the earth doesn't move, in some absolute sense, it doesn't follow that the earth is flat. That's a, that's a, that's a common, 
conflation that flat earthers seem to be making. They want to argue that the earth is, is, is flat. And they want to argue that the Bible teaches that. Many of the verses they throw up at you are the type of these verses that geocentrists have been using for a very long time. So how much overlap is there between, so not all flat earthers are geocentrists or all flat earthers are geocentrists, but that geocentricity is a totally separate issue. Yeah. The, the all flat earthers are geocentrists, are geocentrists, but not all geocentrists are flat earthers. In fact, <clears throat> until very recently, flat earthers would be a small subset within the geocentric set. However, yeah. I, I suspect today that there, are the, that there are far more flat earth geocentrists than there are globe earth geocentrists. It's flipped around on them. And in many respects, the, the geocentric movement has been absorbed by the flat earth movement. The flat earth movement has absorbed a lot of things. The Apollo moon landing denials. I first encountered that 20 years ago. Now it's been subsumed by the flat earthers. I think there are very few Apollo moon lander deniers now who are not flat earthers. So it's absorbed a number of, of different other conspiracies and different ideas. So that's the point I want to make is the fact that <clears throat> it doesn't follow automatically the earth is flat, even if the earth is geocentric. Now, to get more to the question of the scriptures involved there, uh, there are passages coming from primarily the poetic books of the Old Testament, or poet, put it this way, poetic passages of the Old Testament. And it says, the earth shall not be moved. I believe the Hebrew word used there is mot. And the exact same word is used several times, uh, David writing in the Psalms, referring to himself, that he shall not be moved. So if you're going to argue that this use of this word indicates that the earth is absolutely stationary, does not move at all, then you have to argue that David never moved. You have the David-centric theory at this point, which is, <laughs> which is absurd. Nobody seriously suggests that David sat down one day and remained there for decades, never moving after that. Obviously, translations are not exact. Um, when it says the, the, the word for move can be translated topple, deviate, those kind of things. And we use different words for that. So what's happened is the word has been translated in, from Hebrew into English as move. <clears throat> and it's not an exact equivalence between those two words because it can mean other English words as well, often depending on the content. So can something move and not topple? Well, yes. You know, moving from point A to point B and not topple, it's got a very smooth, direct motion. And again, being in the poetic passages, you need to be very careful how you handle those. I got a newsflash for some people. Uh, I don't believe everything in the Bible is literal. <laughs> we, get, we, we creationists get accused of that all the time. We say, well, you believe everything in the Bible is literal. No, I don't. There are many examples of simile, examples of metaphor, examples of uh, allusions and so forth, uh, allegorical things. <clears throat> However, um, those elements of non-literal usage are largely absent from the historical books. Occasionally in the Old Testament books, there are poetic things that come out, like the song of uh, 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 Deborah, Deborah and Barak. You know, there's a song that they sang in the book of, a book of uh, Judges, and it has a lot of poetic usage. But the, the battle before that did not. And, and so you know, there, are, there are figures of speech and idioms that are used. But um, there, you shouldn't fear saying, well, just if, if there's poetic usage in, in um, certain passages of the poetic, the poetic books, it doesn't follow then that you can use that same approach to the to the historical books, such as Genesis. We say that Genesis, rather than being literally true, is historical narrative, and historical narrative is to be read straightforward, except for idioms and figures of speech. And so uh, there's no danger there whatsoever. It's not a slippery slope at all that people are freaking out over uh, this, this issue. So when it says the earth shall not be moved, I think you need to look at the context of what it's saying. It's talking about the earth being stable. And things can move and be stable. It's not addressing cosmology. It's not talking about the earth moving in a physical sense any more than David was not moving in a physical sense. So people are taking this passage and treating it in a hyper-literal approach. And uh, they're, they're inconsistent with all of this. Uh, some flat earthers like to talk about, they have this cosmology, Rob Skiba's one, with the, with the earth sitting here with a dome over top. And he and he quotes a passage that says that the earth is God's footstool and the throne is above that. So he's got a picture of a throne up here above the dome and the earth is like a little footstool sitting underneath him. Well, does God the Father have feet? Well, does he have fingers? Does he have eyes? Does he have ears? 
is you have uh, hands. All of those things are used in the Old Testament to refer to God, the eyes of God, the fingers of God, the hands of God. And, and to say that God, God the Father has a physical body, I think is heresy. And uh, the Mormons like to, like to teach that he has a physical body like you and I have. That's not the image of God it's talking about there. So when it says that he's got a throne, does he, does he actually have to physically sit in a throne like a, like, a, like a human king might? I don't think so. I think maybe this is, this is given to us in a way that we can comprehend what's going on. That throne, by the way, represents authority. It represents kingship. It represents judgment as a judge sitting over us. Um, is, is it a literal throne? I don't know, but I don't think he has a literal body to sit on a throne anyway. I just don't think scripture teaches that. So flat earthers frequently take what are non-literal usages, what should be clearly non-literal usages, and try to make it hyper-literal to the max and all of these things. And that's just the wrong approach to scripture. I remember a pastor recently, or a, a, a church member to this church sent me a, a video of their pastor recently talking about how he had a college professor who uh, said, look, you know, at all this poetry in the Bible and uh, I think Genesis is just poetic. And so he kind of gave, kind of out of nowhere, just did a video to his church talking about how he did not believe that Genesis was literal history and talked about poetry and stuff. And immediately what came to my mind was the, the Psalms. And, and I thought of Psalm 20, is it 22, uh, where it's uh, foreshadowing the uh, crucifixion of Christ. Yeah, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you far from helping me? Uh, and it talks all through these things in a poetry sense, that literally happened to God, that literally happened to Christ. And so I was using kind of the opposite of what you're using here going, just because it's in a poem doesn't necessarily mean that it's only poetic. Psalm 22 is obviously a reference to the future crucifixion of Christ. So I'm sure those that believe more of a, that, that the poetry is literal would, would look at that and go, well, how do we decide when it's literal and when it's only poetic? Because and maybe that's a bad argument. Maybe I'm not giving a good argument there. But when are they? When would they do that? Well, well, I, th I, th I would dispute Genesis being poetry. People have tried to identify what they view as being poetic elements, but we have very good examples of poetry in the Old Testament Hebrew. We have five books that are poetic books, and uh, also poetic elements exist in some other places uh, in prophetic books, and occasionally in the historical books. However, uh, their poetry is a bit different from ours. It's done oftentimes with parallel and, and contrast. The wise man does this, but the foolish man does that. Proverbs uses that contrast. Uh, the, the, the parallel is you'll say it one thing one way, and you'll say it another one. Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse shows his handiwork. It's saying the same thing, it's saying it two different ways. Well, that's not the structure you see in Genesis at all. If, if it is poetry, it's unlike any other examples of poetry that you see. What people have done is they've seen this, this um, what they call it, was a chiastic pattern showing up in the, in the book of Genesis. And it's like an outline that goes from uh, you know made point down a minor point back up to major point. And they're saying this is a bit poetic. And I'm not so sure it's poetic at all. It could be a literary device of some sort, but not poetic device. But furthermore, even if it is, as you said, it does. If it has, if if it does, granted, if it does have some poetic element to it, it doesn't mean that's all it is. You know, the creation account uh, uh, serves as a polemic against the pagan uh, pagan cultures and their pagan deities around them. It, it's certainly liberals say that, and they say, "See, it's, it's just a, it's just a, uh, it's just a polemic, and it's nothing more than that." Well, why can't it be both? You're, you're, you're leaving out the fact that it reads like a historical narrative, which it does. And you know, the, the people say it's poetry, be it with the, with a, with, with it being that chiastic pattern. They can't even agree among themselves where the poetry ends and the, and the narrative begins. And if it's so clearly poetry, you would not have any disagreement. Everybody would say, clearly, at this verse, this chapter, this is where the poetry and historical narrative begins. They can't agree on that because it's not driven by the text and what the text is saying and the style of the text. It's driven by how much you want modern science or modern scientists to dictate to you the history of the world. So the motivation is all wrong. I, I don't think it's very difficult, even in, in an English translation, to distinguish between the different genres. 
when you read poetry, it's clearly poetry. When you read historical narrative, it's clearly historical narrative. And so people I get suppose. confused in this. They think somehow that if it's if you can read it as poetry in one place, you can read poetry anywhere else. And that's that flunk that, that that flunks you in logic, that flunks you in literature, both at the same time. If you can't tell the difference between historical narrative and the poetry, then, then you really need to go back and study study literature a little bit more. Finally, um, uh, as far as the poetic elements and so forth is concerned, you know what's wrong with most history books? What's that? <laughs> Read like history books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, history can be boring. It doesn't have to be. I think history is fascinating, but if you if you take all the soul and wit out of it and, and it reads like a, like a, like an encyclopedia, then it is kind of a boring read. What's wrong with telling a story, a true story, historical account with flair and style? That's exactly what we're finding in, in Genesis, I believe. If you're seeing all sorts of neat poetic elements, you should realize that it's testament to the fact that we have an awesome creator who can communicate very well and do it with flair and style better than any human author could do. That's certainly the way I think about it. Let me ask you this. Let's start with Genesis 1, then. God made a firmament. He said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let them divide the waters from the waters. God made the firmament, divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. It was so. Then, uh, you know, I, he said, uh, let the waters be gathered together under there into one place. Let dry land appear. Then we get down to uh, after the land brings forth. Uh, day four, we have God creating this, this uh expanse, let there be lights in the firmament of heavens and divide the day from the night. What all is this talking about? Let them be for lights or signs in the heaven to give light on the earth. Because uh, here you have God creating the firmament, creating the sun, moon, stars. And then later we hear of a time when the stars are all going to fall. So is this evidence of a flat earth for any reason that that the firmament that he made is more like this celestial dome like I've seen in their pictures? Well, that's the argument flat earthers want to make. They want to say that, that uh, the word Hebrew word there is rakia, and they want to argue that it is some sort of dome, a vault sitting over top of a round flat earth. Where do they get that? Well, they get that out of uh, logo software uh, by, uh, that, that they, they've incorporated uh, a Michael Heiser's little uh, cosmology there where he says that that's what the Bible teaches. But where did Michael Heiser and others get the idea that that is what is being taught there? And they got it from 19th century liberalism. The, the root of this was that uh, they began excavating in, in uh, Babylon, in, in Mesopotamia, and they, uh, they, they uncovered their creation myth. Um, and uh, they understood it, I think they misunderstood it, to be a, a round flat earth with a dome over top. And they said, aha, this is the ancient Near Eastern cosmology, a &E cosmology for short. Well, as it turns out, <clears throat> they found out later that it was just a a and &E cosmology. In fact, it was a misunderstanding of that a and &E cosmology. There are others as well. But they, that liberal scholarship eventually came to their senses on this. But um, they, they then argued what, what's called the, um, uh, the, the uh, document, docu uh, Oh, what's it called? Is it the, the documentary hypothesis that that there were like four sources for the for the Pentateuch, and the uh, Pentateuch was not written by by Moses, if Moses even existed at all. It was written a thousand years later, during or shortly after the Babylonian captivity, and the flood was from the Gilgamesh epic. The uh, the 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 creation story in the in the first two chapters of Genesis comes directly from the Babylonian ancient Near Eastern cosmology, and. Uh, that, that is what Michael Heiser is doing. He's taking that liberal approach from more than a century ago, telling you what the Bible is based upon a wrong assumption or a wrong conclusion about what the Bible and the Pentateuch are. And it's nothing less than an attack upon the, the inerrancy and the authority and inspiration of scripture. Uh, that is the root of this. It's a wicked root, it's a poisoned root and yet these flat earthers have imbibed with this and have no idea the history of how this idea came about. So they, this wrong idea that the, that the rakia or the firmament is this dome gets established. And uh, whatever the, the rakia is, a thing God made on day two, it's very clear that was where he put the luminaries, the heavenly bodies uh, on the, uh, into the greater light, the lesser light, of course, the sun and the moon and the stars also are all located in that, that, Firmament of heaven, it says in King James, three times it says that, expanse of heaven in more modern translations, because I think 
brachia actually correctly is, is translated in English as expanse. So once they've decided that there's a dome over the earth, and uh, it's pretty close to us, then that's where they're going to place the sun, moon, and stars. But I think there's good physical evidence that, that the sun, moon, and stars are not just a few thousand miles above the earth. They are very far away from the earth. Wherever the heavenly bodies are, that is what God made on day two. It's pretty clear to me that that's what that is. So they, the flat earthers from the very beginning, uh, rakia is a key term to them, but they insist that, that of a certain interpretation of that, and that if, you're, if, you're, if you disagree with them, then you're calling into question uh, uh, all of God's truth of scripture. This idea, this notion uh, really is very modern in, or, or, uh, in origin. And I know some world-class Hebrew scholars, uh, I know some world-class theologians, and not one of them endorses this. Now, when I, when I point this out, the people, flat earthers with a straight face, will tell me that I'm just quoting man. You know, they want to know what God's word says. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, what's that? I'm going to Blue Letter Bible right now. <laughs> yeah. You got to go. They, they want to trust what the Bible says, but, but, when two different people, two or more people disagree on what a passage means, who's to say who is right? And again, I know godly men who have dedicated, you know, a half century to studying scriptures. They know the Greek, they know the Latin, uh, the Hebrew. Uh, they, they've studied this from one end to the other. And you get a guy who's seen a, U, a few YouTube videos, and he thinks he knows more than these, these theologians and Hebrew scholars do. And that is unbelievable hubris in my mind. It's just hubris off the charts uh, to dismiss this. I, uh, I once, and they have their own unique interpretation, and I, I ran this past some flat earthers a couple years ago. I related how 45 years ago I was taking a Pauline epistles class from a very, very godly professor, and he had us write commentaries on certain passages, certain chapters of some of the Pauline epistles. And, you know, we'd read the passage around, we'd consult we consult some 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 uh, uh, some commentaries, and then we would write our own on the basis of this. And he cautioned us. He said, "If you find uh, an understanding of a, of a passage that no one else has found before, there's probably a very good reason. It's probably not there." <laughs> <laughs> and when I when I gave that, when I told this to some flat earthers without missing a beat they just dismissed it because that was the teaching of man well who are you <laughs> you're telling me that, that, that you know, this godly man who spent far more time than you ever will studying scripture and uh, you've spent a little bit of time studying scripture and and you don't know nearly as much about scripture as he does and your interpretation is correct as his, his is incorrect because he's just the, he's just a man well you're a man too so what makes you special uh, that, that you have the right understanding. And again, this is hubris. Hubris is, uh, maybe I should define that term, it's a combination of colossal ignorance and colossal uh, uh, confidence in what you believe. You, you have no reason for being confident, but you are very supremely confident in that. That's what hubris is. And I see this coming out again and again with flat earthers. That it may hurt for people to hear that, but it's the truth. I see people who know very little about the scripture yet they think they know a lot about the scripture. And they dismiss anyone else who disagrees with them as being wrong. And that's, there's no other word but hubris for that. So I'm looking at the Blue Letter Bible, uh, blueletterbible.org. You look up that word in Genesis 1, 14, firmament, rakia, uh, extended surface, and they have parentheses, solid, comma, expanse, comma, firmament, expanse is A, and then firmament is B, and then it says considered, heavens, and then it says the actual definition properly and expanse, i.e. the firmament or apparently visible arch of the sky dash firmament. So are there people that would take the fact that it says solid and actually use that to say, aha, the firmament, well, I guess now I'd, I'd be confused because the, the flat earth argument would be that the firmament did he place the stars in the firmament? Does that mean the stars are in the, well, it says the birds fly in the firmament as well, and the air is not solid. Anyway, trying to. No, no it, 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 the far as the birds are concerned, there in, in verse 20 of chapter one, it says that the birds fly on the face of the Rakia of Shemayim, the expanse of heaven. 
it, it's, it says something different. The face, the same word is used in uh, Genesis uh, 1, uh, uh, 2, where it says that uh, the, 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 there was darkness on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was moving on, on, on the face of the waters. Use the word face there twice. It's the same word used Hebrew word used in chapter 20. It's across the face of this thing. So whatever this expanse is, the birds are on the face or on the near side of this thing. Uh, and the stars and sun and the moon stars are apparently deeper into that, and more inside of it rather than on the surface as the birds would be. But this whole thing of the rakia, the firmament, is a key concept for the, for the flat earthers. It doesn't address the shape of the earth per se, but they take that definition you just read there, or the multiple listings there of the things, and they zero in on the one they like, the one that the they word agree with, and they, 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 exhort, they ignore the rest of it. But it says, it gives definition there, and the definition of the word is expanse. That's what the word means. Now, they have then give perhaps shades that people have given to it. One of my favorites there, it comes out of Brown Driver Briggs. It says, um, it's like the second, second definition there, and it says, thought of by the ancient Hebrews as being a solid dome. Now, notice what they've just done here. It's the opinion of Brown Driver Briggs, men, giving an opinion about what other men, the ancient Hebrews, thought the rakia was. So what they're doing is they're not giving you that when they put that thing there and they say, it, you know, it's, it's thought to be a dome here. They're saying that's defining it. No, what you're giving there is one group of men's uh, opinion of what another group of men's opinion was about what it meant. All that proves is they might be wrong. <laughs> Either Brown Driver Briggs might have been wrong in their understanding or and or the ancient Hebrews might have been wrong. Just because the Hebrews might have thought it was a dome doesn't mean that's what it means. It may have meant what they thought it was, but that isn't what the word actually means. Incidentally, Brown Driver Briggs was a translation of like the 45th edition of um, all the German, oh, the name's escaping me here, who did the, uh, the, the great lexicon that went through like 45 editions. And um, uh, it went through like 30 editions after he had died. And uh, the earlier editions didn't have that definition at all. The, about that comment, I should say, about thought of by the ancient Hebrews, that came in very late uh, editions of that German lexicon uh, for the Hebrew. And that reflected that archeology span I mentioned, the, the ancient Near Eastern cosmology of a disc with a dome over top. So uh, that's, that's one reason why it's important a true Hebraist will know not only ancient Hebrew, but a, a several other ancient related Semitic languages, as well as German, so he can read those early lexicons and, and understand them directly. That's why you and I will never be Hebraist because we, we don't have the depth of knowledge and ability in language. I don't have the ability in language, I'll put it that way. Well, it's interesting because I did look up, because that's one of the arguments I heard is, look, ancient Hebrews, if you study what they actually believe, and they've got pictures online of this kind of hot thing with a, with a solid dome over the top. Matter of fact, one of the guys that emails me regularly after every email I send out, his name is Ben. He's in my Grand Canyon movie. I met him at the Grand Canyon a couple years ago. He's like, I mean, this was more of the science side, not the scripture side, but he's the one who keeps saying, look, there had to be a hard dome over to hold the air in because you cannot have gas pressure next to a vacuum. And we talked about that in the last one, the vacuum right. of space. So that dome, that hard layer is what's holding in the air. And well, that, ha that has to do with the science so-called that we talked about, but, but he's making the insistence that, that the, the ancient Hebrews viewed it that way. How do we know that? The ancient Hebrews didn't leave any cosmological writings. They didn't. Uh, the, the closest you might come is Enoch 1, uh, but even that's problematic. And uh, so, so people are making assertions here, and it's based, again, I keep going back to this, where do they get the notion that that, that was the cosmology of the ancient Hebrews? They well, get it from the cosmology of Babylon, and the, the, the Hebrews picked it up while they're in captivity, a good thousand years after Moses existed and wrote the Pentateuch. You see, the whole foundation for that belief is bogus to a person who's concerned about the authority and inspiration of Scripture. Wow. So, so the, the map that I'm looking at, drawn, it's right here online. This was not drawn by the ancient Hebrews. They didn't draw No, it. <laughs> of course not. It was, it was drawn recently. 
And, and this, this understanding goes back to maybe the 1880s. And, uh, and it was just picked up. The conservative, uh, conservative Bible scholars at the time ignored it. It was really picked up in the 1990s, a century later. Paul Seeley was the first one to do this. Later on, John Walton. And then Michael Heiser is the big one now doing this. Michael Heiser has these, has these drawings. And maybe Michael Heiser's drawing you're seeing there. I know in Logos they use his drawing. Is it kind of blue looking? It is. It's blue looking. Yep. It's yeah. got like Sheol right yeah, underneath. That, that, that's probably Heiser's drawing. And that's not found in any real Bible. It's, it's found in my, Michael Heiser's writing, which go back, you know, 20, 25 years maybe. And uh, Michael Heiser says, this is the cosmology of the Bible. This is the cosmology the Bible teaches. Of course, he doesn't believe that cosmology. But at the same time, he believes in the inerrancy of, of Scripture. And I'm still trying to get my head wrapped around that one, how you can believe both of those simultaneously. Because he's saying that, that Genesis has mistakes in it, has errors at the very beginning. If he wanted to say that this is how the Hebrews viewed this, it might be true. He can't prove that it might be true. But that's not what he says. I have to. I have to assume he just just didn't say it properly. But unfortunately, hmm. they like to quote him all the time and show these little diagrams. But this is not coming from any ancient source. It's coming from a modern source in interpreting a certain thing upon what the Hebrews thought. We have no evidence really from the ancient world what the Hebrew cosmology was. I can't say that enough. It's it's true, and just because other people want to draw that, it doesn't make it true that that this was the cosmology because we don't know. So. I, whenever I look at a drawing like this, I think back to school when I learned about other religions that believed the earth was on the back of turtles or elephants, or the, and when they moved, that's what created the earthquakes, and my mind still goes, okay, even with your drawing, that's the foundation. Okay, well, what's the foundation sitting on? I still ask myself that question. It feels like I got the same problem with this drawing as I had with it being on the back of elephants and oh it's on the back of elephants and you know it's like what are the elephants standing on what are the well, turtles no 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 Eric here's your problem you believe in gravity I do that's and a problem flat earthers, flat earthers don't it's no problem if gravity doesn't exist then the earth can just sit there and not worry about falling because there's no such thing as gravity do they have a counter model for for that or is it just no that doesn't it, i mean well, they, they give some they give some flim flam about buoyancy and they don't understand the physics of buoyancy either when they say that gravity doesn't exist what they mean i think is the 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 uh the observation that objects tend to fall downward that's what gravity is unfortunately what they what they mean is newton's law of gravity is not true and you ask them, well, how does gravity work? Why do things fall downward? And they can't agree among themselves what it is. And this touches upon what we talked about before. I, I find that flat earthers uh, consistently, they, they, they only tell you one thing they believe affirmatively. They believe the earth is flat with a dome over top. Beyond that, they, they, they view the world, world in negative terms. They, 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 what I mean by that is they tell you what they don't believe. You ask them what causes things to fall downward. They say, well, I don't know, but it's not gravity. You know, what causes eclipses, I don't know, but it's not the shadows of the Earth or the moon. You know, they, 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 how far away is the sun? I don't know, but it's not 93 million miles. They, they tell you what they don't believe rather than what they do believe. So they don't, have, they don't feel compelled necessarily at all to tell you why things fall downward. They don't believe in gravity. So you're hung up on this idea that the Earth is sitting here, it's going to fall downward. They say, no, it doesn't have to do that at all. It's just sitting there because God ordains it sits there. That would be their point, I would think. And the fact that it says, the Bible says, it, uh, he hangs the earth on nothing. So that foundation for the earth, the foundation is on nothing. Well, their, their argument, though, they say they says hanging. And, and what they mean is it's like God was holding his fingers crossed behind his back when he said that. He, he, they argue that it's suspended, it's supported underneath, but it's not suspended from above. There's not wires hanging down holding the earth. It's, uh, if you're doing engineering terms, it's uh, nothing under tension, it's under compression. You know, there's between tension and compression. A suspension bridge is hanging, all right? All right. Uh, a cantilever, a beam bridge is not hanging, it's suspended underneath, it's supported underneath. 
So they would argue that that when it says it's not suspended, it's not hanging down from something above, like a hook up there to hang hang the earth down. They would say the foundations underneath. So to me, that robs the power of that statement that the that God hangs the earth upon nothing. Well, duh! If he's got foundations underneath, literal foundations, then it's kind of obvious that there's nothing hanging there. What's the majesty? What's the point of saying that it doesn't hang on anything? I think they they trip over some technicality what the language might mean. And, and miss the obvious implication that doesn't mean anything once you rob it of that. I think so, when it says the earth is hung upon nothing, it means that nothing supports it. But they're hung up on this idea that ha hanging has to be something from above. Okay, so if they say it is on pillars, it is on foundation, I still ask that question, what are the pillars on? Well, they don't answer that question. They don't feel, if you ask a flat earther that question, they won't have an answer for it, but they won't be concerned either. So don't expect them to think about it and come back to you. That's not a gotcha in their mind that, that, that they don't, if they don't like something, they just don't think about it. Huh. Well, how much of this, because I want to hit a couple more passages here. I think of that one I read in, um, on my Facebook Live this morning, just I, uh, Isaiah uh, 40, 22. Yes, the, um, the circle of the earth. Yep. It is he that sits on the circle of the earth. Isaiah has other words for the word sphere or ball. He doesn't use that. He uses the word circle. Therefore, it's definitely teaching a flat spherical yeah. disc, which in my opinion goes against other arguments they use saying that there are four corners to this round disc. But anyway, what specifically <laughs> sphere versus circle, what is the Bible actually teaching? Okay, the, the, the word there, the Hebrew word there is, is hug, and they say that this word means circle, a two-dimensional round thing like this. Now it's, it's inter and so therefore the earth must be a disc. Now what I find interesting is that um, I've heard creation speakers and creation scientists for years argue that this word hug means a globe or a ball. I, I recall your father using that argument. Henry Morris using that argument. I believe uh, John Wickham used that article. I've heard many people use that argument. So, so both sides can't be true on this, can they? Um, so I've asked some of my Hebrew experts about this. What does this word mean? And they uniformly tell me that it means something round. Now, when I say round, what do you think of? Well, you might think of a circle. You might think of a globe, because both are round. Eric, if you ask the average person that's not a flat earther, if you ask an average person, what shape is the Earth? They will tell you the Earth is round. Uh, very few people will say it's a ball or a globe. They'll say it's round. Flat earthers say that the earth is round because both a disc and a globe are round in some sense. One's two-dimensional round, one is three-dimensional round, but both of them fit the definition of round. I, I think the word hug refers to something that is round. So can it be a circle? Yes. Could it be a globe? Yes. So does this, does this particular verse prove either one? The answer is no. Hmm. Not the satisfaction. I, I would love to, I'd love to sit here and tell you it definitely means globe, but honesty compels me to say otherwise. It, now, hold on. They say, good, we, our side, but actually they've lost the verse, you know, because that verse doesn't prove it's a circle either. Now, here's the, here's the further point they say. They then skip over to Isaiah 22, 18. And there it talks about tossing Israel uh, into, uh, like, like you toss a ball. In fact, Correct. it says ball, all right? I literally toss you like a ball. Right, and it says, the word used there, the Hebrew word is kadur, a totally different word from who used in Isaiah 40, 22. And they say, aha, the five say, aha, you have here a word that means ball that, that Isaiah could have used in chapter 40, if he went to say it was a ball, but he didn't. In fact, he used the word ball elsewhere, kadur. So therefore, it follows that in, in Isaiah 40, 22, that that word who cannot mean ball because otherwise he would have used the word kadur instead. Well, that's fine. You can make that argument if you want to. However, the same word is used on Isaiah 29, 3. Would you read that for us, please, since you have it open? <laughs> Isaiah 29, 3, and what does it say? Isaiah 29, 3, mm -hmm. I will encamp against you all around. I will lay siege against you with a mound, uh, and I will rise, and I will rise siege works against you. It's talking about siege, besieging a city, and it uses the word kadur that people just said, the flat earthers just said, and Job, uh, 
uh, in Isaiah 22, 18 must mean uh, a bowl, but clearly in Isaiah 29, 3, it doesn't mean a bowl. When you encircle a city, it's generally in a loop of some sort. It doesn't have to be a purple, a perfect circle, but it is a loop around it. So right or away, a really big tarp to trap them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's clear that Kadur, the same word you, that appears in Isaiah 22, uh, 18, in 29, 29.3, doesn't refer to a ball. It refers to a circle, a two-dimensional circle. They never talk about this one. They like to go to Isaiah 22.18, trying to, trying to interpret Isaiah 40.22 to say something it doesn't say, and they totally ignore 29.3 of Isaiah. And that totally undermines their argument. I think the word kadur, like the word hub, both mean something round. And it can mean a, a three-dimensional round like a ball. It can mean a two-dimensional round like a circle. So they've overstated their argument here. Uh, you come out of the book of Isaiah, and it's not clear that the Bible is teaching it's flat or a, or a globe. It could be either. It, 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 and, and it gets back to my point I've said many times. I don't think I've said it with you tonight, but I think the Bible is a bit ambiguous on the cosmology. He doesn't tell us that the world is heliocentric. He doesn't say it's not. He doesn't say the world's a globe. He doesn't say it's not. He leaves those things kind of open. The cosmogony is clear enough, and we ought to be more concerned with the cosmogony, the origin and history of the world, than we should be with the geography. Since the Lord has left uh, that question unaddressed, I think it's perfectly reasonable as part of our submission of the world, as which is part of our commission given to us in Genesis uh, 2, uh, 1 and 2, and in uh, Psalm 8, it's perfectly fine for us to use our ability to measure and probe things and determine what the shape of the earth is. And God has given us the ability to do that. Well, and that's why I really enjoyed the science going through that last one, because the science, several of the things you said just one after another, I went, these kind of knock this whole idea of flat earth down. The science doesn't match what the flat earth model would predict. Okay, I got another verse for you here. And uh, then I, want, I still want to come back to stars falling. Um, this is Job 37, verse 18. With him have you spread out the skies, strong as a cast metal mirror. <laughs> now this is... This is the Evidence Bible. So, um, my old Evidence Bible was King James, and uh, somebody at a church somewhere that I spoke in the past has my old Evidence Bible and has not returned it. So uh, I left that somewhere when I was speaking, so this is my new Evidence Bible. It's new King James. I'd have to look up what the King James says on this one, but it is, I mean, the idea of God hammering this thing out, the idea of God, you know, creating this is what he did is he hammered this thing out for us and he created this like this like hard solid dome on top of us the bible isn't that what it's saying well no uh notice that the word used there doesn't say expanse it doesn't say firm it says sky doesn't it it mm -hmm. doesn't use the word rakia doesn't use the word shemayim it uses a word and it escapes me what the hebrew word is right off the top of my head it doesn't matter really but the word <laughs> Uh, has two meanings. Uh, one is dust, which is kind of hard to, 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 to jive with this particular verse. The other one is a cloud. I think what happens there, if you, if you kick dust up in the air, it, it has like a cloud-like appearance. This word is used to describe clouds before. Now, clouds and the expanse or the heaven are not the same thing. The clouds appear in the expanse or in the, in the heavens, but they're not the heavens or expanse. So for that verse to be translated sky is a bit of a reach there. It would be best rendered as clouds. Now, if you put cloud in there, suddenly the verse doesn't seem to address cosmology at all. And I also hasten to add that, that Job has some Hebrew constructions that are unique to it. And it's difficult, and this is one of those, it's difficult to translate. If you go and you compare 10 or 12 different translations, you will find they are all over the place. Mm. So trying to ferret out what this means is a little difficult. Also, it uses a simile there, doesn't it? It says it's somehow like a uh, molten or cast uh, looking glass, yes. something like that. As a, not, yes, as a. 
so what's it, what it says like is it re, it's not saying it is something. It's not a metaphor. It's not a literal literal thing either. It's somehow making comparison. Is it shiny like a looking glass? Is it uh, somehow metal like? You know, those are looking glasses then were made out of bronze. Uh, what is the comparison? I don't know. I, I've suggested maybe it has to do with the kind of dark appearance that some 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 clouds have. Sometimes we talk about a really low lying, rainy looking clouds. We say it looks leaden. You ever heard of that expression before? Yeah. It looks like lead. Of course, not too many clouds are made out of lead. They would sink really fast if they were. <laughs> it could be highly reflective, you know, like like cumulus clouds on a sunny day. So it's problematic to tell you exactly what it means. Uh, but in this case, I don't think it's to be identified with this this expanse or heaven because a totally different word is used here. They see the word sky, which I think is a poor translation, and they run with that, equating that with this this dome that they think they see, uh, the rakia being from from Genesis Genesis day two account, and then and then make that thing made out of metal. And and I see what you're saying, Ed, but the word is uh, shakak. Shakak. That that's it. Shikak? Yeah. Uh, and it does, in, if you look it up, it refers to dust or clouds usually. Dust clouds, fine dust, a thin cloud. That's what it's referred to. Um, so, yeah, a a powder as beaten small. By analogy, a thin vapor. Um, and so it's um, it's not talking about the, the the any any dome or sky. It's talking about a cloud in the sky or clouds in the sky. Yeah, very cool. And then there's uh, let's see here. Uh, what was I looking up? Proverbs chapter eight. I'd written several of these down. Mm -hmm. Proverbs eight. Let me find it here. Yeah, similar thing here to go with the Job. It was um, when he established the clouds above and he strengthened the fountains of the deep. When he assigned the seeds. Uh, it's, oh, yeah. 27. When he peppered the heavens, I was there. <laughs> when he prepared, <laughs> prepared the we'll take that out and use that as a sound clip. When he prepared. <laughs> my, uh, when I heard peppered, I thought, wait a minute, I, I don't think I remember, I don't remember that one. <laughs> when he prepared, yeah, I am at that age, believe it or not. I, I remember my dad eventually holding stuff farther and farther away until he finally got glasses and I'm 42. I, I, can't, I can't focus within two and a half feet of my face, so you're kind of a blur right now. If I want to see you, I have, oh, never mind, I don't want to look at you. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm finding things blurry now, and I'm like, I can't. How, how old are you now, uh, Eric? 42. Oh, you're just a kid. <laughs> Wait till you get to my age. <laughs> this is rough, man. All right, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above. So is there an idea of, because that's another one of the maps that I see when I look this up, somebody has drawn a square map with a circle kind of earth kind of, push down inside of this square map, which... Well, I think, is that the, is that the verse that talks about the, uh, the, the division between night and day being the circle of the earth there? Is that the one circle on, inscribing a circle on the earth being the division between night and day? Is that what it says? Or is that, a, I think of another passage that says... Might that. be a different one, Michael, the foundation. All right, all right. Interesting always. I don't see it right there within the next three verses. Okay. All right, there's one passage that talks about the division between night and day being a circle. Um, so again, it's talking about, uh, what is this passage again? So this is inscribed, he drew a circle on the face of the deep. And what, what book is this from? What chapter? This is a Proverbs 8, 27. Uh, this, this is the personification of wisdom, is it not? Uh, wisdom was there when all this, speaking of creation in very poetic mm -hmm. terms, uh, Oh, one would come away from this thinking the earth is flat with a dome over top only if one went into this passage thinking that. If you, if you take the blinders off and read that passage, I don't see how in the world you, you come away from that passage teaching you that the earth is flat and a dome over top. Uh, I think it could, be, it could be understood a number of different ways, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily teach that the earth is flat at all. I don't, I don't get where people think that. Only if they have that notion to start with. That's, that's what often happens. Flat earthers have the belief system. They then approach scripture, read it that way, interpret it that way, and then they flip it around and say, well, this is what the passage says. Well, no, only because you read it into what the passage is saying. Do you think the phrase face of the deep 
in 27 there is referring to creation, wisdom, when he drew a circle on the face of the deep. Is that referring back to Genesis 1? I think, I think so. I think Genesis 1, 2, where it talked about darkness and then light upon the face of the, face of the waters when God created light. The deep there is, is mentioned. Uh, it's the same, I'm sure it's the same Hebrew word that's used there talking in verse 2, the deep, talking about the great depths of ocean there. It's the same thing. And it's probably referring to the light that is creating on that. Uh, does that passage necessarily mean that the earth is a globe? I don't think so. I think it's ambiguous enough that it could be read any number of ways. Yeah, I was actually going to say, we're going to face that same problem where a circle can be a sphere. And I would describe the earth as a, as, what's the shape of the earth? It's a circle. Um, okay, what about the passages? And by the way, I did look that up again, Blue Letter Bible, uh, a compass. Um, uh, he said, a compass upon the face of the depth. Uh, a compass is... Kind of the way uh, the word is, is it uh, Hebrews 23, 29, C-H-U-W-G? So that's, that's the word means something round again. Right. So he, he put this, right, so again, we're, it's not definitively saying flat. It's not, I mean, you could, you could apply that same thing to this. God inscribed a round earth it, it could be either one out of the deep. I mean, that's, he did, yeah. he started with the deep and then, and then, went the, or, and then created the earth out of that. Okay. Yeah. I'd love to claim otherwise, but honesty prevents. Yeah. And then, um, okay. What about four corners then? So again, back to my map that I'm looking at showing a square, like a square table with an earth round indented inside of this square earth. That's and the Bible Orlando Ferguson. The corners, the corners of the earth. That was the Orlando Ferguson map from the 1890s. I call that the roulette wheel a model. Yes, <laughs> that's, like that's exactly of. what it reminds me of. And what, he, what he did is he took that passage from what, Revelation 7, 1, I believe, and that in, in turn is an echo of a passage from Isaiah. There are two places that, that talk about the four corners of the earth. The one in um, Revelation talks about the four corners, the four winds and the four angels, one at each corner. And uh, most... Again, most people who study scripture more than I and you have put together uh, would say this is probably referring to the four directions, four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Look at the winds there. If you listen to a, watch a weather forecast, they'll give you information like the temperature, the dew point, and they might tell you the wind, and they'd say it's out of the southwest. They're going to reference it to the four compass directions here. And it, it's idiomatic, we believe, in Isaiah, idiomatic for, for four corners. Four quarters. Um, we even use that today. We talk about the four corners of the of the of the earth in English. It's talking about the remotest parts. It's talking about different directions on the earth. It's an idiom. It's not to be taken hyper literally. Idioms can get you into trouble. Uh, we have idioms in English that make perfect sense, like uh, "You're pulling my leg." Try translating that for people. I've seen it done, and it's very embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I speak in other countries, a lot of our little slang terminology sure. i had to tell that i say something that i remember and i'm a translator i'm just i forget that forget that you know, the, the interpreter may know, know what the effective idiom is in that language if he's the target language in which case it's okay he'll, he'll translate it appropriately but you gotta okay. be careful how, it's an idiomatic expression how much of this so there are a lot of people in america and i know the numbers are kind of going back and forth i don't know that we have a real solid number on the number of people but we watch the whole flat earth movement kind of just rise up to become quite a few people in the U.S. and around the, I say around the world, uh, uh, in, in the world believe this. And I, and I go, how much of this is a, a Hebrew or Greek versus English issue? How much of this comes out of the English versus people getting it from the Greek and Hebrew? Do you, do you I mean, any idea on where that's at? It's a mix. Sometimes people will see a word in English and think it has this, this must have this word, like I mentioned the word move earlier, and the Hebrew word there actually has that in a, in a few other meanings, um, and they latch onto one. But many times you, the, the, they play amateur, amateur Hebraist here. They will go into the uh, lexicons, attempt to do this, and they don't know how to work them properly. A perfect example of that, as we already discussed, was the rakia. They latch on to the, what their pet uh, definition is there, while they stumble over the primary definition, the, the, the clear definition of being expanse. If they admit it means expanse, then much of their argument crumbles at that point. 
So that if they want to hang on to that dome, they're going to have to go nibble on the edges with the with the less uh, accepted definitions of it. And, and those definitions that are that are giving you a dome sort of thing are, are things of how people have misapplied it, not not the definition of the word itself. Because I, I did look up the word inscribe right before that word circle. And uh, it literally means, you know, to cut out, to decree, to set, to engrave, to, uh, to, it's, to, to enact, to decree a law. To, anyway, it's just to trace, to mark out. And so it, I'm not seeing how, well, let, me, let me put it this way. Based on the map that I'm looking at of a lowered earth, it looks like the whole thing would stay flooded all the time, in my opinion, based on the way that well, thing looks. The Orlando Ferguson map is not terribly popular except when the four corners are mentioned and then they go to that, you know? And I ask, well, how do you get four corners out of this? And they always, they always show me that, that a meme with that picture on there. And not that they want to endorse it, they're just simply throwing that out. And it's one of the situations where they're throwing something against the wall, hoping something might stick. That's the one lame attempt that flat earthers try on this. But for the most part, they don't talk about the four corners very much um, at all. I have, yeah. So, so what, what, hang on that, that, that to me, I go, well, time out, time out. What, what's the, why wouldn't they, wouldn't they have to adopt if they're literalists, wouldn't they have to adopt this square table with a, with a sunken? I'll tell you the way they normally handle that, that, those, that, ver those two verses. I actually heard flat earthers make this argument. They say four corners of the earth, and then they show you a picture of a globe and they ask you, where do you get corners on a globe? You can't. Therefore, this disproves the globe model. And when I'm giving this presentation at that point, I'll hold up the, I didn't bring the big prop this time. I hold up a round prop and I just look at it. And my audience usually starts laughing, starts giggling after a while, because obviously, just as a sphere has no corners, a circle has no corners. And they want to argue that certain verses of the Bible say that the earth is a circle. It's a flat, round circle. Fine. Then what do you do with the verses that say that it has corners? Just as you can't have corners on a sphere, you can't have corners on a circle. So if it's a problem for the globe earth, it's a problem for the flat earth too. You can't have a flat, a round earth. Yeah. Yes. You can't have it both ways. Yeah. And as far as I know, other than Orlando Ferguson, no one in the history of the world has really su seriously suggested a checkerboard or chessboard shaped earth. If they have a flat earth, it's usually round. Interesting. Um, so it's uh, that one. I, I not all flat earthers use that argument, but when they do, it's usually an attack on the globe earth, never thinking to apply it to their to their own model. And to be blunt about it, most flat earthers don't realize that the same argument applies against what they're choosing to believe. Hmm. Okay, I want to open it up. I want to go to Q and A. Oh, actually, we haven't had any of you guys. We got a bunch of you on here, and I haven't seen anybody post any questions. So, if you got a question, there's a little Q and A feature right down there. Would love to to get you to join the conversation here and ask Dr. Faulkner some questions. While they're doing that, Dr. Faulkner, uh, are there any other passages that I left out that you go, Eric? This is one they use all the time. Let me tell you what's going on with that. Did, or, or did we kind of cover? I mean, the four corners, circle versus sphere, uh, the the hammering out the mirror, the expanse, the rakia. Are there any other ones that you go? They, they like to talk about uh, Daniel 4 and the uh, tree that could be seen from all the earth. Okay, okay. I and was thinking they, of something else. I was thinking of some passages in Revelation that I didn't get to hit. Uh, right, for, I was going to get to those later, okay? Okay. But, uh, that's, that's one they like to use, Daniel 4. And they say, uh, what verse is it around verse, uh, well, they say the tree grew up so tall you could see it from all the earth. And they say on a globe, at best, half the earth could see it, but on a flat earth, the entire world could see it. So therefore this proves that the earth is flat. What they fail to acknowledge is in that in the whole chapter, chapter four is an enclosed account of something. It's the enclosed account of a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. This tree was in a dream. Things that happen in dreams, I don't know about your dreams, but my dreams are, to, to put it mildly, are surrealistic. There's nothing real about them. I've had some really, really colorful ones. Oh, I've had some weird ones. Um, <laughs> and and, uh, and my, then they, they have to realize that it's a dream of a pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar. And inside of a dream, it doesn't even, it's not even a real tree because it's in a dream, but even it's not a real tree because as Daniel interpreted the dream, it represents Nebuchadnezzar. 
So what's literally true in this chapter? Well, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. There was a tree in his dream. Daniel interpreted the dream and said, that tree in your dream is not a tree, it's you. And this is what's going to happen. You're going you're gonna to lose your mind for seven years and eat grass like a cattle. And it did do that. He, he went mild, mad for seven years before he was restored to his own mind. All of that's literally true. But it hardly teaches cosmology. It's not clear it teaches the cosmology that, that Nebuchadnezzar believed. If tonight I dreamed that the earth was flat, that wouldn't prove that I thought the world was flat, let alone that the earth is indeed flat. So I can't believe they use that argument, but some flat earthers do. They also like to refer to uh, the temptation of Jesus uh, recorded in Matthew yes. chapter 7. And with that one, they, they say that in Matthew's account that Satan took him to a tall mountain where he showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. They say, aha, the, uh, the, the kingdoms, you know, the, oh, this could not happen on a globe, but it could happen on a flat earth. And I say, fine, where is this earth? Where is this mountain? Where does it exist? And they, they can't point it out. There is no place on even a flat earth where one seriously suggests you can see all the kingdoms of the world. So obviously, that's that's a problem for them. But uh, if you go to the other two synoptic gospels, they also handle the temptation of Jesus. And they don't talk about those at all because neither one of them mention a mountain. One of them says that uh, Satan took him up. Doesn't say how high it took him up. He was in the wilderness. There are no tall mountains in the wilderness, but there are higher places. Or it could have just lifted him up off the ground. We don't know. And the other one doesn't mention a height at all. It simply says, and this is interesting, it, this is in Luke's, uh, Luke's account. He says that, uh, uh, it says that, that uh, uh, Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the earth at once. And to me, that suggests more of a vision rather than a vista. That's what, how I put it in my, in my, in my book. Um, so it's important in many times to collate different passages, in this case, the three synoptic gospels to find out what it means. And they're trying to milk a cosmological meaning out of that by looking at one of the three. But if you take the other two in account with it, it doesn't look like such a, such a good argument after all. And again, if such a mountain existed on the earth, where is it? The flat earthers haven't even begun to tell us where it might be. There's no known earth, mountain on earth that could do that. So that's one of the ones they, they like to talk about too. That is a good question. I, I hadn't thought about that. Let's, let's go back to that mountain that Satan and it took Jesus to, to be able to look at this just like they did. Yeah, let's go there. Where is it? Interesting. Uh, and then um, hit the ones, we got two questions now that have come in I want to get to, uh, but hit the one um, about, um, it, it, what are the past, there was some in Revelation that I had seen. I don't know if I can remember them off the top of my head here, but in Revelation. The stars will fall. Yes, yes, oh, I did want to get to that. The stars are going to fall, yes. So obviously they're just, oh, by the way, would a flat earther claim that the stars are inside that, that solid dome or are they underneath the solid dome? The, most flat earthers would say that the stars are located uh, in, the, in, the, um, in that dome, but most flat earthers would also say the sun and the moon are probably below the dome a little bit. They don't, they're not in the dome itself, but just below it. Most, not all, would say that. Got to be and, careful. And because the stars are moving, is it the dome that's actually, the, 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 the hard dome that's actually spinning around, or are the stars moving inside of that? No, the hard, the hard dome is spinning around, and it carries the stars with it. And then the stars we see fall, uh, we would call them meteors, they're not clear what those things are. Some of them claim it's chunks of that dome that have fallen off and fallen to the earth. Others would claim that they're fallen stars. A uh, very common belief among flat earthers is that stars are, they tell you again, if you ask them what they are, they'll tell you they're not big balls of gas. Some flat earthers say that the, uh, the earth is a, uh, the stars are angels. And these are maybe fallen angels that are, that are mentioned here. So, um, so is it punishment for them to be stuck up there in the, in the sky like that? It's is it not clear. <laughs> okay. Again, it's uh, not clear at all. And I'm looking for that passage in Revelation. I, I uh, started looking at the index. Yeah. And, and, uh, I, I had it looked up. it up. I'm sure I deal with it in the book. I'm just not finding it. Um, 
All right, it's uh, Revelation 6.13. That's the one I was looking at. Okay, 6.13. Read it to me, please. Coming up. All right, Revelation 6.13. This is with the uh, talking about the third seal, scarcity yeah. on the earth. Fifth seal, sixth seal. Yeah, during the sixth seal, the co uh, cosmic disturbances. I'll start at 12. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, uh, sackcloth of hair, and the moon, I got to back up even more, uh, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Okay, now, this, do parts of that sound familiar to you? Well, it should. They talk about the sun being d turned to blood. That is right out of Joel 2 and quoting by Peter at Pentecost on, in Acts 2. The sun being darkened uh, is, is found in the uh, Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24, and I believe the other Synoptic Gospels have a shortened version as well. But the sun and the moon being darkened are mentioned there. I'm of the opinion, after studying this long and hard, that when it says the moon is turned to blood, it's not talking about the moon turning red. That's become a common belief today, the blood moon nonsense of a few years ago. You probably remember that. Yes. Well, Talk uh, about that. Think about it. In, in Acts chapter 2, he's speaking to a Hebrew audience. In Joel chapter 2, it was definitely a Hebrew audience. They were quite familiar with the sacrificial system there at the temple. If you went to the temple and you saw where they sacrificed the animals, did they clean up between the sacrifices? No. What does blood look like after a while if it's left sitting on something? It turns very dark, doesn't it? Almost black. So instead of this, people thinking blood is it issues forth from the body, I think what they would have been thinking of, they would have, they've been looking at this stain-covered temple area and the altar that was probably black or near, very dark brown. So I think it's talking about the moon being darkened, and that works very well when you go to the Olivet Discourse. So it's not just the sun's going to be dark, but the moon is being darkened. The moon being turned to blood, I think, is talking about the moon being darkened. Now, the Olivet Discourse, Jesus is quoting from several Old Testament passages that talk about the sun being darkened, the sun going down at noon, again and again and again. So you see this taking place. The heavens will be shaken. The moon will be darkened. It says also the stars will withdraw their, their light as well. So now we're talking about something catastrophically happening in the heavens where the, both the moon and the sun and the stars are being darkened. But if you read any one of those passages, some of those elements are missing. The all of the discourse in Matthew chapter 24 contains most of those things together. But what's interesting, I want you to read Isaiah 34, 4. Okay, read if you would Isaiah 34 4. Isaiah 34 4. I feel like I'm on Bible drill right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falls from the vine, and as the fruit falling from, the fig, from a fig tree. Can you notice the similarity to what John wrote in Revelation there? He yeah. says, The heavens will be rolled up. He's obviously making an allusion there. He makes a, likens it to fruit and a vine. Now, it's not exact the comparison that John makes in Revelation, but it's so similar that you have to assume that, that John is thinking of that passage, giving a loose translation of it. The one in Isaiah is tricky because the object of the falling is not real clear. If you start examining that, you begin to realize that they have to kind of flesh it in what it's actually saying. It's not real clear what's falling exactly or what's withering. Uh, John's a little more clear in the Greek and the New Testament. But there's, as similar as it is to what Isaiah said, there's one element that John added. It's found there and nowhere else. It says the stars will fall to earth. Interesting. Now, why, why did he add that? I don't know. Did Isaiah omit it? Did Jesus omit it? You know, it's the only place it's mentioned. Now, if we want to collate these numerous Old Testament passages, and I, and I have someone before me here, I'm not going to read them, I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask you to read them, but <laughs> read my book and you'll find out more about it. And I, in fact, in my book, the, uh, 
uh, the, the creator cosmos. I do talk about this, I have a whole chapter on apocalyptic stuff. And I try to collate all of these passages and I, I put side by side what's missing, what's added, what's, what's, what's there. If you take a very hyper literal approach to it, you have to assume that every one of them is talking about a separate unique event because certain details are omitted from one and added to others. Well, I don't think so. I think it's talking about one event or maybe one series of events, but it's not talking about different things at different times. It's talking about one collective thing taking place. And so when it talks about the dimming of the stars, that's, I think it's happening, it's dimming. So could Isaiah have been saying that the stars are gonna dim as if they had fallen? You know, it's a way of saying that. And by the way, falling doesn't have to literally mean dropping from point A downward to point, point B. Gibbon wrote. That's interesting. I didn't think about that because I'm always thinking falling to Earth. Uh -huh. Like Gibbon wrote, "The rise and fall of the Roman Empire." Did 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 Rome just fall off a cliff or something and fall fall down? No, oh, yeah. it's talking about a metaphorical sort of rise and fall. Uh, William Schreiber wrote, "The rise and fall of the Reich." Again, it's a metaphorical thing. So it's possibly when it talks about the fall of the stars in Isaiah, it's not talking about a literal fall, it's talking about a metaphorical sort of fall because they withdraw their, their shining at that point. And why did, why did John add that thing falling to the earth? I don't know. It, it seems to suggest falling down to the earth, but on the other hand, maybe he was embellishing that a bit. It's no more than, than the stars no longer fulfilling their functions of, of shining and providing light on the earth. Now here's the kicker. The, the flat earthers here engage in a good deal of equivocation here. Equivocation is where you use a word two different ways, switch the meaning on you. Um, and this is a, a, anachronism, an anachronistic type of equivocation going on here. The, the ancient words for stars, aster in Greek and kokob in, in Hebrew and in many other languages, refer to any bright luminous body in the sky. Right now, if the sky is clear, it's evening time in the eastern part of the United States, if you go outside, you will see two bright stars, Jupiter and Saturn. They look like stars to me. In the morning, you'll see Venus, a very bright star. It, Mars will be up uh, later on tonight, very bright star. Uh, you know, a few weeks ago, a, few, a couple months ago, I was looking at Comet Neowise. The word comet comes from the word for hairy star. And then, <laughs> then uh, last, last week, we saw the peak of the Perseid meteor shower. On my trip, I saw a bunch of Perseids, even photographed some of them. And uh, we sometimes call them shooting stars or falling stars. So that's what they look like, all right? Now, the term meteor goes back about 400 years. It's a modern concept. And the, the word for planet is also more, more recent origin as well. And we have other words for different things like nebulae. Those are, that, that also was a star as well, a fuzzy star. My point is this, is when, when John and Isaiah and anybody else is writing about the stars, speaking about the stars, are they talking about stars in the ancient context or in the modern context? Well, clearly they meant in the ancient context, so they would have no idea if you use the word meteor, they'd say, what's that? But they knew what a star was. So it's possible that Isaiah, if you want to believe these things are falling down out of the sky rather than just turning faint, it's entirely possible it's talking about a meteor shower. And I've heard flat earthers mockingly in tone, you know, how could stars fall to the earth? They're far bigger than the earth is. And so therefore, since they're going to fall to the earth, then, then the earth must uh, the, 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 co the conventional cosmology must be wrong. Well, that's nonsense. If it's talking about meteors, meteors are small. We all know that. They're trying to force the, the stars here to physically fall to the earth. These stars we see at night in the modern context of the word and enforcing it back on the, the uh, uh, John's first century writing and Isaiah's, what, uh, seventh or eighth century writing. Uh, and that's just wrong. You can't do that. So I'm giving you two possible outs here. It's talking about dimming of the stars, or it's talking about a, a talking about um, the stars actually falling, but they're being meteors rather than stars as we understand that term today. And so I, I see the flat earth is making this mistake of, of having this anachronistic use of the modern word for star and what the what the modern word means, and that's just wrong. So just a couple of weeks ago, I was at a friend's house. We're standing there in his driveway talking. And I look up and I see like 10 stars shooting across the sky. It's like 10 in a row. And I'm just like, Dave, what is that? I, I, got, my, I got my phone out. You're going to laugh when you, you probably already know what it is. I got my phone out. I start videotaping. I'm like, 
I turned the phone around to us. I'm like, okay, my name is Eric. This is my friend, Dave. We have not been smoking anything. We have not been drinking. I don't even do that. This is what we just saw. And then I go home and look it up. It was Elon Musk's uh, satellites going across the sky. <laughs> they, they, they got me back in April. I went out one evening. I didn't know what it was. If, if, if I believed, I saw about 50 of them in a row, very bright. Yes. And if I believed in, in flying saucers, uh, I could believe that that was our armada invading the earth. It was, yeah, it was absolutely. Some, never seen anything like that before. But they, it, they it was so crazy rolling. to see them going across the sky. So anyway. those, Eric, in the ancient in the ancient context, those were stars. And that, and that's what makes me go. I wonder sometimes some of the things even talking about in Revelation. And now we've got nuclear power, and you could you know melt things, melt the earth, and. Sometimes I wonder if he was seeing things that he had no clue would be in existence that I, I wonder, I don't even know if we should or not, but I wonder so when I read some things in Revelation and read some of these things, I go, I wonder if that's apocalyptic stuff talking from everything he knew, that's what he was describing. But man, this is actually a, a nuclear holocaust or something like that. And I almost wonder if, if, I mean, how many satellites are up there? And, and, and Elon Musk wants to have, I think it's 40,000 satellites encompassing the earth in order to provide internet to the world. Um, John, John clearly was struggling to describe what he wrote, what he saw. And uh, he has some similarities to Ezekiel chapter 1 and 10. And clearly Ezekiel was struggling with what he saw to describe what he saw. So you're absolutely correct. I mean, he was putting down in terms of what he could understand, and uh, it, I think we need to we need to grant a little more latitude when it comes to that. When he says star, he's writing about stars in his own understanding of uh, throughout the history of the world. We've changed the definition of stars. We should not necessarily impose our definition upon how he understood it. And that's the problem. That's the reason I keep pointing out, this is equivocation through anachronistic use. You're, you're sort of like, remember anachronisms in Shakespeare? They had things in Julius Caesar that hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> so you know, what's happened here, flat earthers are importing into the first century meanings of words that didn't exist yet. Well, I know that they would probably say that, that what we're presenting this idea that it could have been something other than the actual gas star in the, you know, light years away. The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its, uh, its late figs uh, when it's shaken. Yeah, and that comparison is, that, that's, that illusion is coming right out of Isaiah. And there's a detail thrown in that John puts in that Isaiah did not. And when you try yeah. to collate it with the other many other passages, I think I think maybe you can back off to these things actually falling to the ground. I think it's talking about them failing. I mean, it could be a meteor storm, but it could also be these things failing because their light failed or failed to, to shine anymore. Wow. Okay. You guys have been really patient. Thank you guys for hanging out for this conversation. I want to get to the questions that I haven't had got to go to. I got three that have come in so far. One is from Travis. He says, what about in Joshua when he commands the sun to stand still? This would mean the earth had to stop spinning. So if that happened, like if the earth stopped spinning right now, would we just go catapulting, you know, at a thousand miles an hour? Let's see which way am I spinning? Yeah. Yeah. Would I go that way a thousand miles an hour? If God did intervene miraculously to instantly stop the earth and not to stop you, yes. Because remember I talked about we have momentum and it takes a force to change your momentum. And so if the earth momentum was arrested, then we would continue forward. But if the earth, if God is going to stop the earth from spinning rapidly like that, then he's certainly going to do the same thing for us. Okay, good point. If he can stop the whole earth, he can stop us. What do you think happened there? I think uh, the, the miracle was worked and the earth was stopped spinning. And just put pause. Now, the old, they found the missing hour, or the, the, the missing day, uh, uh, NASA discovered, not true, right? Rubbish. We have to have an article on our website about that. Yeah, I've read that. And by the way, that story began circulating in the 60s, uh, probably a little over 50 years ago, uh, with NASA computers, but actually it was told by a fellow named Totten 100 150 years ago. And it was a different version without computers, believe it or not. It's an interesting story that's been around for a while. 
I think in my article, I actually talk about that, give a reference for Totten's work about that one. So it's an old story that got resurrected because computers can do magic, you know. Wow. At least in the 60s, I thought we thought they were capable of doing magic. Um, Michael asked this question. By the way, if you got a question, I'll, I'll try to go, and we're going to be out of time, but I'll try to go as many as I can. If you got a question, there's that little Q&A panel, please use that. Where does the Bible mention an ever-expanding infinite universe since creation ended on the seventh day? Uh, this is from Michael. Yeah, it doesn't. Um, first of all, I don't believe the universe is, is, is eternal, and I don't believe that it's, in fact, almost nobody today believes it's eternal. I don't believe the universe is infinite. Uh, nobody knows. People assume that it is, but some people don't assume that it is. And then as far as expansion is concerned, uh, just because the Bible doesn't mention something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, the, the Bible doesn't mention four little four large satellites, you know, moons, if you will, orbiting it, yet I can see them almost any evening with a telescope. Uh, I, the Bible doesn't, doesn't mention red blood cells, yet I believe they exist. You know, the Bible doesn't mention I have a brain, but I think it exists. Uh, you know, the Bible doesn't mention me, it doesn't mention you. A lot of things we, we know exist. There's, a lot of flat earthers like to say, well, if it's not mentioned in the Bible, it doesn't exist. And that's a, that's a huge fallacy people are making. Now, some people want to argue the 11 times that the Bible explicitly mentions the, the stretching of the heavens, that, that's referring to the expansion of the universe. I used to entertain that belief as well. Now I believe it's referring to what God did on day two. God made this expanse on day two, and how did he make this expanse? Well, he expanded something to make that expanse. So I think that stretching out of the heavens actually happened on day two. Okay, so that is, because I was going to ask you, are we, when, when scientists today see the quote expand, or talk about the expanding universe, are we still seeing the effect of creation? Is that what we're still viewing? Is the effect, or is well, it like, no, that's... I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it was Edwin Hubble 91 years ago who discovered a correlation between redshift and distances for galaxies. That's generally been interpreted as an expansion, but it is an interpretation. The data don't tell us the universe is expanding. It merely tells us there's a correlation between redshift and distance. That's the simplest explanation. I have no quarrel with it, but I am certainly open, particularly from a biblical cosmology viewpoint, to an alternative interpretation. I've not seen one yet that I like. Okay, that's interesting because... Did, and, and did I see, I don't know if this was out, did they just re redo the age of the universe again back to 12 billion? That was, uh, that. <laughs> uh, I saw that, some article and I was like. Yeah, Wait, yeah. I, I saw the article and I read it and I, and I read the news accounts. Then I read the original article and I, the original article never mentioned a, a younger age for the universe. I don't know where that came from. Uh, that actually came from a press account of somebody talking about it. The article itself that was based upon never mentioned the age. It was uh, simply reevaluating the expansion rate, which we've been arguing about for uh, for a dozen years now, at least. Okay. So that was interesting. Another question. Rob asked, Proverbs 8.27, we went into that. Proverbs 8.27, he says, you clearly describe the definition of the Hebrew word. Uh, however, I said that when I looked it up. Uh, meaning inscribed, cut into, to engrave something. So how do you inscribe, cut into, engrave a globe into the vacuum of space? I guess I don't understand the question. <laughs> so Proverbs 8, 27. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I, I don't understand what, what, what's the supposed problem with the vacuum of space. It gets back to the thing we talked about before. Uh, you know, how can you, have, how can you have an atmosphere around the earth in a vacuum. I think that's what he's getting at there. And that's, that has nothing to do with this verse, I don't believe. So when he prepared the heavens, I was there when he drew a circle on the face of the deep. So inscribed, when I looked up that word, though, I mean, inscribed, cut into, that can be 3D. It doesn't just have to be 2D. I don't think that, like that passage, I'll pull it back up here yeah. again on the uh, I think it's ambiguous. I mean, it can be either one. You're right. It's something that's curved. It's something that's round, but round in what sense? We don't know. Yeah, to cut in, here's the word uh, again is uh, kai, kai kak? I don't know. Kai kak or shakak. Um, I did take Hebrew, Aleph, Bat, uh, and, and I, can't, I can't remember most of it. Uh, <laughs> to cut out uh, and agree to, again, it also has the, the, the definition 
to decree, to inscribe, to set, to engrave, to portray, or to govern, to like, you know, I think of all the laws that were made. He governed, he created, he uh, decreed, enacted, the one who decrees, the lawgiver, uh, something that is decreed, the law, to, to be inscribed. So when you look up the word, um, to, to engrave, I, I guess my mind doesn't immediately go to a disc that is hollowed out. I go, did Michelangelo engrave David in a statue in, in marble? Yes, but that's a three-dimensional shape. I guess I'm not seeing Rob, maybe, oh, how do he, he replied here, how do you engrave a ball into space? Is, I guess that's your question, Rob. How do you engrave a ball into space? Well, if God already had the, the waters there, right, in Genesis, and then he created the earth, or, or according to this, if this passage is even referring to this, he drew a circle on the face of the deep, talking about um, the, the wisdom of God is what this is talking about. He drew a circle on the face of the deep, inscribed, uh, cut into, well, it still goes back to that, that answer, right? It's, whether it's a flat or a ball, it doesn't say. It doesn't go either way on that. You know, I, I don't pretend to, to know what this passage is saying. It's tricky. Rob, come, hey, Rob uh, is, is uh, communicating with me here. He says, how do you carve a ball into nothingness that is the vacuum of space you can only carve out of something that has substance. Um, I, don't think, I don't think this passage is saying the face of the deep was, was space. I don't know. It's not saying that. You're reading something into it. Again, this, this passage is pretty unclear. I think it's referring back to day one, exactly what part of day one it's talking about. I think the water was there and God is engraving something round on that, that mass of water. Was it shaping it to a ball? Was he scribing a circle where the light, where it's dark? There's another passage that says that. So I'm not sure what this passage means. It's not clear at all to me. And I think anybody who says that they, they, they know exactly what this passage is saying, they have to read an awful lot into the passage to reach that conclusion. Rob, I don't know if you can be a little more clear on this. I've just got a couple more minutes, but you said, uh, he responded again and said, you have to have something to cut into. And I think that's, that's clearly, yeah, that, that's fine. He, he already had the, the, the watery the mass. Would probably describe as a watery ball is the best I would think of it. Well, as, no, I would say watery mass. Oh, okay, watery mass yeah. at the beginning of creation. When, there in Genesis chapter one, and God, engraved or, or cut into it or inscribed um, a circle. And we still don't have, okay, I, I don't know. It's hard for me to say, yeah, that's evidence of a flat earth to, to say circle into that because this is a circle or a disc would be a circle. And he already, he did have something to cut into. So maybe you, uh, so where then is space in this scenario? Where Where is space in, I would say that, my opinion that it's okay, if, you, funny. if you want to know if you want to know where space was we're talking day one and i don't think space as we know it existed yet that comes along in day two so the simple answer is space did not exist then so all we had was which is hard for me to get my mind wrapped around oh it's, it, i think it's hard for you <laughs> imagine a picture i'm a big position i'm in but that this I think space as we know it today was this thing God made on day two. And I believe this verse you're reading here refers back to day one. So space did not exist yet. Okay, that's hard for me because I've, oh, no, I've taught no. that space existed. I've taught. <laughs> wow. Um, uh. <laughs> yeah, how do, you have, how do you have a watery substance with no, a watery mass? With no space, because that is kind of the way well, I envisioned this. It could God's be that all, the, all the space existed was encompassed in that watery mass and no more. And Remember, so what I think is space was expanded off the earth on day two. Rob, I don't, I don't know if, I'm assuming, Rob, I'm assuming you're a, uh, somebody who believes the earth is flat based on your, your comments here, your, your questions here. The face of the deep is frozen according to Job. The circle was carved into the solid frozen deep. 
Is that something you've heard before or some kind of argument that you've heard before? Me or Rob? Yeah. I've never heard that the solid frozen deep. I, I, I tend to think it was not frozen because there are words for ice and uh, the word used there, uh, Mayim refers to liquid water, liquid H2O. Okay. All right. Well, it's, um, it's interesting to me because even when I read that, you know, to, if I were to carve something, I, I can carve something in 3D or I can describe something in 2D. It's, uh, I guess I'm not really seeing, I, I'm not getting the point of, of why that passage would be. Um, I'm assuming you're, you're claiming that that is a passage that teaches flat earth. Um, and I'm not, I'm not getting it from that. If he inscribed a circle, he could inscribe something that looked like this. That would be in circle. You could carve out to fix, to decree, inscribe, set, engrave. Uh, it, 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 that's, it doesn't answer that question. Dr. Wagner, any other um, thoughts you have on this? Um, um, on that? I think we've covered a lot of the major passages that flat earthers like to claim as being evidence for the Bible teaching the earth is flat. There are a few other minor ones, but they're not coming to, to mind readily. I'm uh, looking up one more that Rob, I think, just threw in there. It's a Bible, uh, the Bi a Bible hub link, 3830. The waters harden like stone and the surface of the deep is frozen. Job 38.30, the water is hidden like stone and the surface of the deep is frozen. I've never heard that one used for a flat earth verse. I don't know what, how, how you argue that point there. I, so verse 29, from whose womb comes the ice and the frost of heaven? Who gives it birth? The waters harden like stone and the surface of the deep is frozen. I guess I'm assuming, Rob, you're saying that's referring to the deep of Genesis chapter 1. I don't think that's referring to Genesis chapter 1 at all. Um, well, I, I'm not familiar with the verse. I'm not, I can't, I'm not prepared to answer that one right now. I've never heard that one used before. Yeah, I just, I okay. If you're, I don't understand where you're going with that, Rob. So that's, that's I'm not sure what okay, you're trying uh, to There's one other passage that, that, I've heard flat earthers use a lot. That's Job 38, 14. Uh, if, you want, if you want to turn to that one. Okay, yep. It takes on form like clay under a seal and stands out like a garment. Yeah, now if you, if you look back, you've got, it says, uses the, yes. the, the, the uh, pronoun it. So you have to look back to the, see what the, the antecedent is that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked shall be shaken out of it. And they say that the, uh, I think what they're trying to argue there is the antecedent is to it in verse 14 is in verse 13, the earth, the ends of the earth being shaken, it's turned out like a clay to a seal. And what they're trying to argue here is that when you use the seal, the clay was, was flat and you put the seal across it, and they try to argue that this is referring to the creation week, when God is forming the earth and giving it shape and definition. Now, it's interesting that this same, same passage sometimes has been used by people to argue the earth is a globe, and they, uh, the people, many the flat earthers try to say this is a signet ring that's pressed down into the clay, but actually more often uh, in that part of the world at the time, it was not a signet ring at all. It was a cylinder seal. And they would roll this, this seal over the clay, so it's rolling. And that rolling action, they say, is like the earth rotating on its axis. I think both sides are maybe reading too much into this again. Furthermore, that's not the antecedent of the pronoun it. You need to go back to verse 11, all right? Mm. What's it say? When I said, this, this far you may come, but no further, and here your poured waves must stop. So it's talking about, yeah. The, the, no, no, the, no, no, uh, Job 38, uh, uh, oh, 12, uh, 12, 12. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked shall be shaken out of it? It takes on the form like clay under a seal and stands out like a garment. So it's talking about uh, 
And it, then it continues in the next verse, and from the wicked their light is withhold, and the high and high the high arm shall be broken. It's all a little four four verse you know passage found inside of there. The question starts off in verse 12 by asking Job, have you ever commanded the morning and the dawn to come? It's like a poetic sort of thing because it's using a, a parallel parallelism there to say that. Have you commanded the, the sun to come up and the dawn to happen? I showed you before we started tonight uh, approaching dawn of, of some of time lapse that I did. And you can see this coming. It happens in a matter of seconds and then over, over maybe a half an hour that this comes. And the obvious answer is no, Job can't command that, but God does. He goes on to say that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, talking about the, the dawn taking hold of the ends of the earth and shaking the wicked out of it. And it gets back to the principle that, that people tend to do a lot of crime at night. You have thieves that go out at night because they're, they're, they're hiding they're what they do. They generally don't act in the daytime because people can see clearly what they're doing. So the dawn comes up, and as it does, it exposes the evil deeds of men. It's like you're picking this thing up and shaking it out and out for all the wicked for everybody to see. It's not saying that it's literally taking hold of the ends of the earth. It's figuratively doing that. It says that it might take hold, uh, that they might be shaken out. It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. It's talking about the daylight revealing the landscape. You know, when you look at the landscape in the dark, you can't see anything. You can't see the hills and the bumps and the rocks and the trees. But as daylight rolls over the thing, it reveals these things and it transforms the landscape just as you might transform an amorphous piece of clay by rolling a cylinder over top of it. This isn't talking about the creation of the earth at all. Wow. It's you got to look at the context. That's one of the things that I see flat earthers consistently fail to do. They will grab one little verse out there and even sometimes just a part of a verse and say, this is what it means. And they don't look at the antecedent. I've had arguments with flat earthers about this, and I can't get them to see that they've ripped this horribly out of context. They just quote uh, the first part of that one verse, verse 14, it is turned as clay to the seal. Aha, uh -huh. the earth was turned like clay to the seal. The clay is flat, therefore the earth is flat. And that is such sloppy hermeneutics. I mean, you just want to slap them in the next week. It's so bad. <laughs> because it's, it's in context, it's not talking about Genesis 1 in the least. And I've seen that happen, play out repeatedly. People will grab verses. There's one verse that people, some of them like to use. I can't remember the exact passage it is, um, but it's, it's quoted from the Matthews Bible. You familiar with the Matthews Bible? It yes. It's a very early English translation. And in the Matthews Bible, it reads, uh, refers to the people camping on the flat earth. It's spelled F-L-A-T-E. <laughs> Earth is spelled kind of weird too. And in this in this verse uh, elsewhere, it's it's uh, uh, it's translated as open fields. What it is, flat ground that you're working on. If you're going to go camping, if you've done any camping at all, you want to pitch your tent on reasonably flat ground. You may be just one little spot big enough for one person to sleep on a hillside, but it's flat there. And because this one verse refers to the flat earth, some flat earthers, not all, but some of them have actually taken that Matthew's bad translation and said, this says the earth is flat. And again, that's ripping it way out of context from what it means at all. And I see repeatedly flat earthers taking things out of context. Rob uh, replied with a little bit more detail here. I guess the vacuum of space is what he's trying to get to. He says, Proverbs says the earth was inscribed into the deep. Job says the deep was frozen. Again, I don't know that that was talking about cosmology at the beginning. Genesis, um, Genesis said the earth appeared out of nothing or out of the deep. Nothing about any vacuum of space uh, or a globe of, or any of this. Nothing in Genesis about a spinning earth, thousand miles an hour, uh, around the sun, which didn't show up till day four, uh, and traveling 67,000 miles around the sun either. So maybe I guess that's why this whole inscribed thing is a big deal to Rob, because he's saying... Well, it's conjecturing a lot of things, uh, an argument from silence. As I said earlier, there are plenty of things that are not mentioned in, in the Bible. Um, atoms aren't mentioned in the Bible. 
molecules are not mentioned in the Bible. Red blood cells are not mentioned in the Bible. You and I and Rob are not mentioned in the Bible. By this reasoning, none of these things, including the three of us, exist. That's just bad logic and bad hermeneutics. Um, and flat earthers do this consistently. They say that the, the, the day four account, in fact, nowhere in scripture does it explicitly say that the earth, that the moon shines by by reflecting the light of the sun, so therefore it must have its own light, own light source. But that's a lousy argument by, by silence as well. Uh, again, many things are not mentioned, but that doesn't mean that they're not true. Um, this is just a sloppy way of reasoning. I, I, I can't say it any more politely than that. <laughs> but people want to make that kind of argument. And, uh, you know, vacuums aren't mentioned, but vacuums exist. I, I don't think that that, that Rob doubts that vacuums exist somewhere, some form of a vacuum actually, but yet by his own reasoning, it can't exist because nowhere in scripture does it mention a vacuum. And on and on and on it goes. We can play this game all night. You know, I could, I could give you an endless list of things that are not mentioned. America is not mentioned in the Bible, so therefore America does not exist. Donald Trump is not mentioned, so Donald Trump does not exist. And Nancy Pelosi is not mentioned. Boy, I wish he didn't exist. And on and on we go on this, on this playing this little game um, just because something is not mentioned explicitly doesn't mean it's not there. So last one, and then we got to go because I'm starving. I didn't eat dinner yet. Um, Ro Rob replies, he says, hey, if you, if you try to inscribe or carve or engrave a ball into, into uh, air right now, you're going to get nothing. And that's the point I'm trying to make. The circle was inscribed into the frozen face of the deep, according to scripture. And I'll let you respond, but I just want to say, first of all, when I look at that word that's used in Job 38 right there, uh, it can mean decreed, it can mean commanded, it can mean engraved, it can mean, so it sounds to me like what you were saying, Dr. Dr. Faulkner, is, is accurate. It sounds to me like, Rob, you're, you're, you're projecting a view on the scripture. How do we know it's not just he decreed the earth uh, out of the deep? He decreed it. He um, said it, uh, enacted it, uh, the one who did it, he engraved it. Um, I'm still not seeing how that is a, is evidence of, of what you're trying to communicate. If you're trying to communicate this idea that the earth is flat, I'm not seeing it. Inscribed does not necessarily mean flat. It does not mean two-dimensional, but does that help you understand where he's trying to come from? You know, I don't think any of us are trying to say, if you try to engrave a ball out of air, you're going to get nothing. I don't think any of us are trying to claim that. So, interesting. Um, all right, Rob, I hope uh, maybe you can make that a little more clear. It just didn't seem to make sense to me. Um, oh, how, how do you know that's not what it says? Drew carved a circle just as it says. Um, you believe in a ball in space. Uh, yes, you are. You believe in a ball. I do believe in a ball in space, not based on that verse, uh, based on a whole lot of things. Uh, that verse does not make me believe ball or flat uh, doesn't do a whole lot for me in, in this regard, just so you know. It's, uh, it's kind of moot. I think that's, uh, I think that's pretty weak. Um, awesome. So what verse says the earth is a spinning ball in space? Oh, yeah, hey, there, there's a good one. Hey, Rob, thanks. Is there a verse, Dr. Faulkner? We got you on this one. Is there a verse that says the earth is a spinning ball in space? I get that question all the time. And no, but it doesn't follow then that there is a spinning ball in space. I keep saying that over and over and over yeah. again. It keeps coming up. Uh, flat Earthers want to insist that in, unless, unless you can find a verse that contradicts their understanding of the world, then their understanding of the world is the default position. And that's nonsense. I mean, I could turn that around and say, well, unless you can, you can definitely prove otherwise, then my, what I believe is the, is the default. Nobody gets to claim uh, exclusive right to being the default position. And again, just because something is not mentioned doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That's, that's a logical fallacy of the first degree. And, and that's, flat earthers repeatedly commit that fallacy over and over and over again. And now Rob is going back. Appreciate the, the, the questions coming in, Rob, really do. It says, but it does describe a circle inscribed on the face of the deep that is stationary and set on pillars under the firmament. So again, that goes back to the whole, the whole well, tying, hour and a half. He's tying, together a, he's tying together a bunch of different verses and putting into a nice little package that he's chosen to interpret and claiming that he has exclusive right then that that is what it definitely means. 
And there are many, many people that know far more about Scripture than the three of us put together who would strongly disagree with that conclusion. Yeah, and, I, and the way you really phrase that is pretty good, Rob. I think what, what Dr. Faulkner is telling you is, is you, ought to, you ought to consider this. You are taking a whole bunch of little things from all over the place and trying to create a, a cosmology around a bunch of things. And when you look up these verses, it's not like that Isaiah passage. It's not, doesn't tell you whether it's flat or round. And this Job passage, it doesn't tell you whether it's flat or round. And the word inscribed doesn't necessarily mean, you know, carved into a flat surface. It can mean decreed. It can mean, so again, go back maybe and just rewatch the first half of this, uh, or first three quarters now of this webinar. And I think you'll see um, it's uh, taking those verses to say it definitely means flat is reading, is putting onto the text something that you want to be part of the text. Uh, and then we did a webinar a couple of weeks ago on the science of, of the Flat Earth Movement, how the science is, is really clear. Uh, if you were stationary on a flat disk and the stars were moving around in a dome, you would see an oval shape. You wouldn't see the round shape that we see. And anyway, we went through a bunch of those. So I'd, I'd refer you to that webinar. It's available at creationtoday.org if you want to check that out. But thank you guys very much for jumping in and, and uh, putting in a bunch of questions and, and thoughts here. I really appreciate that. Well, Dr. Faulkner, thank you for joining me for this. Uh, I'm always fascinated to study scripture and find out um, how, because I agree, science and scripture go hand in hand. Uh, true science and a true understanding of scripture are harmonious. And that's what our ministry spends a lot of time doing is, is trying to help people understand how these really do go together. And you really can trust what scripture says. And, and, and the scripture has a lot more to say about the reality of, uh, of, of the spiritual world that we're in. And that's the reality that I really want people to understand. You were created. You were born into sin though. Jesus Christ, the creator, became a human being died the death of the cross, was buried, and three days later rose from the grave, paying the penalty of sin. And he's willing to let that be your payment if you'll ask him. Anybody who repents and trusts in Christ can be saved. So that's the bigger issue that I love talking about. And I love the fact that God's word and God's world are harmonious. They really do go together. Dr. Faulkner, this has been fun. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. All right. I don't know what our next topic is going to be, but uh, uh, got to have some fun with some more astronomy type stuff. Oh, we need to do one on, is this the end of the world? Is cos are the stars lining up where Virgo the Virgin is, is, is she's given birth. And now I don't remember the, the story. That was three years ago. That already happened. It came and went. Is something else going to come in the heavens? We'll have to talk about that later. Okay. That'll, that'll be a fun one. That'll be a fun one. I've been awesome. through ten, 10 ends of the world so far. Say, say that again. I've survived 10 ends of the world so far. <laughs> I, I am going to do a webinar pretty soon uh, with a friend of mine called, Is This the End of the World? I just want to do one on the 10 signs from Revelation and then talk about, I got a kind of a surprise twist ending that we're going to give people. But anyway, uh, that should be a lot of fun. should be a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, Dr. Faulkner, thank you guys. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Everybody who's on the, uh, the webinar tonight, you guys are awesome. Thanks for hanging out with me tonight. Really glad you got to be here. Uh, if there's anything uh, that we can do to serve you, please let us know. You can email me, Eric Hovind at creationtoday.org um, and uh, be happy to try to help you in anything we can. We want you to have answers. Uh, we don't want people to be confused. Uh, confusion causes chaos and that leads to problems. And we've seen a lot of problems come from this idea of the whole uh, the, the flat earth movement. I really want you to understand the truth. You can know the truth. Jesus said, if you'll remain in the truth, remain in my word, you'll, you'll be my disciple. Then you will know the truth and that truth will set you free. So continue to study what God's word has to say, uh, has to say and follow it for the rest of your life. Thank you guys for joining me. God bless you.